Um, hello, my name is Scott Woods. I am a writer, poet, and arts programmer in Columbus, Ohio. I've published a few books, the last of which is a collection of Prince essays entitled Prince and Little Weird Black Boy Gods. As someone who puts on events and is a lifelong fan of Prince, you could say this presentation was inevitable. So, what is the Prince Nightclub Cinematic Universe? Well, it is a fictional universe centered on the nightclubs that appear in Prince films. Uh, why study such a universe? Two reasons, one personal, one academic. The personal reason is because as someone who organizes events and owns a performance venue, I am always keyed into how art spaces operate. The nightclubs in Prince films are almost completely farcical. Um, but what started out as a series of jokes in my head turned into these epic Twitter threads where I could not help but to compare those venues to real world businesses. It made me feel closer to Prince in a way, like I could peek into his mind through interrogating how he thought businesses worked. Uh, the academic reason is to further unpack what Prince does with space. The constant reinvention of the concept of space was not only a recurring element in his work, but a tool he frequently used to control his image and establish boundaries. Prince grew up, grew up playing in clubs. His father played in clubs. He owned clubs. He was in and out of clubs his entire life for both business and pleasure. Clubs are a piece of the puzzle to understanding how Prince saw the world and how he wanted the world to see him. So it should be no surprise that when he set about doing his own world building, uh, that nightclubs were involved. So let's unpack these clubs, right? And how they compare to nightclubs in the real world. Purple Rain, of all the wild things in Purple Rain, First Avenue's business model is perhaps the most fantastic. Here is some math. First Avenue makes a lot of money in the movie and in real life. It is an enormous club. I've toured it, and it's really a disservice to call it a nightclub. Over the years, it's developed into an entertainment complex. But for the purposes of Purple Rain, it's supposed to be a local club just big enough to act as the last stop before a leap to stardom. So that's how we'll crunch its numbers here. Uh, First Avenue's main room, which is within the film where 90% of the musical action happens, can accommodate 1,550 people, not counting the other stages in the building. There were at least two in 1984. So all of my numbers will actually be conservative. So let's say 1,000 people, which would be a fair to Midland night, bought two drinks at an average of $8 a piece for the four to five hours they're in the club. That would be a gross of $16,000 per night in $1984. Of course, a club like that has enormous overhead, but not $16,000 a night overhead. That's a gross of $3.8 million per year. And that's if every night of the year is just an okay night. Also, this is only off of alcohol. I'm not even counting ticket sales, merchandise, or admission fees. So far, so good. Now, let's get into the ridiculous parts. First Avenue only has three bands. I'm not trying to think of a club to, that survives having the same three bands every night of the week, discounting residencies. This isn't Preservation Hall or BB Kings. I can't even think of three major acts I'd wanna see every night of the week. The idea that a club like this runs on a steam of three bands is highly suspect at best. First Avenue may be a meritocracy, but it's a talent bottleneck, which is bad for business. The second problem, is that Billy is cheap. Billy, you're pulling down an easy 16,000 on a fair to Midland night. You gross a minimum 320,000 per month. Even if you paid three house bands a thousand a night, which you ain't because you're a club owner, you're still clearing 13,000 a night. Now let's go crazy and say your nightly expenses, staff, bands, restock, lease, 
utilities, et cetera, are 50% of your gross, you would still net $6,500 a night easy. And let's be honest, you probably pay bands by the week. So you're getting over on them because you tell an up-and-coming band they can play five nights for $1,000 a night, they jump all over it. Bottom line, you actually can afford four acts, Billy. Problem number three, did First Avenue have pinball machines? If so, this is another drag on overhead. Pinball machines are very fragile. They're actually the last kind of gaming entertainment you want in a rowdy club. Plus, this is 1984. Video games were at a real peak then. Even if First Avenue bought aftermarket cabinet games, because Billy is cheap, they should still have something sturdy like Pac-Man, Donkey Kong, etc. Problem number four. So in the scene when Prince confronts Wendy and Lisa about their music during a rehearsal, what is this art installation in the background? Let me tell you something about art in public spaces with drunk people in them that I don't have to tell you because you already know what the problem is. Drunk people who like to party like it's 1999 would tear this installation up in five minutes, costing Billy real money every week. Now, you can have a mannequin delivered to your house these days for about $80, but back in 1984, you either had to steal one out of a department store or make a wish on one in a store display window. Next, what's with these dressing rooms? The Revolution has a dressing room as big as a storefront, and it's stocked like a thrift store for elves. The Time also has a dressing room. It's fair to assume that the modern heirs also have a dressing room. The money lost on the real estate for three full-time band dressing rooms is mind-boggling. I've seen the green room for First Avenue. It's not large, and there certainly weren't three of them. But forget First Avenue's mythical architecture. Let's talk about lost financial opportunities. If you had that kind of space in a club, as hot as First Avenue was, you don't give them to three local bands. The first thing they're going to do is move into them. The revolution's already rehearsing there all the time. You could put in a back bar or lounge or a small room DJ, or a coat room, or just about anything else that would add value. In conclusion, First Avenue of Purple Rain is pretty much Billy's personal ATM. He is either a mad genius or the worst club owner ever. Next up, Graffiti Bridge, a fever dream sequel to Purple Rain, which is why we're doing it out of order which has not one but four nightclubs, all of them run like trash. Some background, Graffiti Bridge takes place in the fictional Seven Corners Art District, Hood, Skid Row, uh, the Seven Corners area, which is populated by lots of steam grates, nowhere near enough streetlights, a most unsavory creative class, and four nightclubs. Glam Slam, Pandemonium, Melody Cool, and the eponymous Clinton Club, owned by a not at all fictionalized version of George Clinton. Let's dive into the problems here because there are a lot of them. Number one, Seven Corners is a really bad place to set up a business. Seven Corners is a Blade Runner set with 200 plus more nightclubs. The only other notable business is a law office that, despite all of the crime in the area, is never open. Every other building is boarded up or closed down. It's clearly a CD side of town. Now, four nightclubs on a block isn't a problem. Ever been to New Orleans, Memphis, a retail strip across from a college campus, that part is perfectly believable. What's not believable is that almost all of them are run like trash and they remain open. Not to bring things down, but we need to unravel Billy's will and testament now. Here is what we can surmise happened after Purple Rain. Billy owned at least Glam Slam before he died. We know this because it is the crux of conflict between the kid and Morse. And we know that much because Robin is a bad, silent partner. 
Robin is not only the daughter of Billy, but is also part owner or investor or financial mark of Morris's Pandemonium Club. Like most women in Prince Project, she holds little sway in any of the decisions of the protagonist. She splits ownership with Morris, but is never part of the management or negotiations. It's a mad misogynistic environment, but as division of labor goes, there are worse arrangements. She dances in the club, but by choice. She lives in the club, buys gaudy outfits, and expresses zero interest in the business side of things. Billy meant well, but he left his money to all the wrong people if it was about maintaining a business legacy. Perhaps Billy was feeling magnanimous in his old age. These two clearly talented local acts apparently never left Minneapolis, or worse, they did leave and came back after sobering defeats from battling a soul-crushing music industry. Perhaps Billy felt sorry for them and decided to take care of them by making them co-owners of Glam Slam. They'd at least have a place to play, and if all else failed, they could sell it later and walk away with a nice check. Third problem, Glam Slam don't make no money. There's a scene where the time shows up after a shift of extorting protection money, and we actually get to hear some real numbers. Jesse, well, George is still acting flaky, man. I think the brother's holding out. Yeah, we need to bust him. What about the kid? They're expecting a little crowd tonight. It won't last though, ain't nobody drinking. Yeah, he'll be lucky if he'll make 1,200. Now, this is all important information. Later, Jerome reports that George's place ate 19 five in one night. It was, quote, a killing. So now we have some sense of the success fail range in the Prince nightclub cinematic universe. Bad is 1.2 thousand a night. Very good is 19.5 thousand a night. So let's revisit Glam Slam's money woes. A club the size of Glam Slam can't afford to make 1,200 a night. 36,000 a month sounds like a lot of money. If you run a poetry open mic, it's not so much if you own a nightclub. The only good news is that the building is already owned. So its base overhead is taxes and maintenance. But the business of a club is entertainment, tickets and refreshments. The average nightclub that size can easily spend at least rock bottom 3,000 a night on staff, entertainment, marketing, utilities, etc. Glam Slam is losing at least $1,800 every time it opens its doors. When you hear about a business being underwater, Glam Slam is the picture in the dictionary. Number five, Glam Slam schedule is whack. One of the pitfalls of clubs is that because live entertainment rotates, it can be hard to nail down a consistent experience. So retention is the name of the game. You have to get people in and you have to book entertainment that keeps them long enough to buy drinks or food. And then you have to get them to do it over and over again until they have children and can't leave the house anymore. None of these clubs appears to have a great diversity of product, but Glam Slam is the worst. The only band we see on multiple nights is the NPG, which is playing music nobody wants to hear. The kid doesn't even let TC capitalize on the burgeoning rap craze. So the lack of diversity in the Glam Slam experience is glaring. Number six, graffiti depresses the value of property. Number seven, Prince changes concept without regard for the marketplace. At some point in the recent past, the kid starts playing spiritual music, which crowds are not feeling. But this is also a dumb business move because Melody Cool is across the street. If people want to hear spiritual music, they can go across the street and hear it from someone who shared stages with Aretha Franklin. They don't need Prince's half-baked rock gospel. It's called market saturation. And because of low diffusion of his product, audience overlap, and close proximity to an arguably superior product, the kids' music has financially driven his club into the ground. Does Glam Slam serve alcohol? Yes. 
you can see people sitting at tables with drinks and a full dance floor. So money is coming in from drink sales, but not enough to succeed. The character Jill is instructive here. Jill works at Glam Slam, which No Shade is perhaps the saddest note of all. She's been chasing after Prince since Purple Rain, hasn't taken a hint in six years. She worked as a waitress in First Avenue and now works, presumably, as a waitress in Glam Slam. In the first five minutes of the film, she's complaining about not making enough money in the club. It's safe to assume that she means tips since that's how server jobs work. Now, she may also be bad at her job, but the club is at least sometimes moderately packed. If she's not making money off of that crowd, then she's probably giving horrible service, which stands to reason if you recall her icy reception of Apollonia in Purple Rain. So, Glam Slam has at least three service problems here. It doesn't sell enough drinks. It has a low bar for service expectations. The boss sleeps with his employees. These are all disasters of management. Number 10, Glam Slam is uninsurable. This club is extremely accident prone. So much bad stuff happens at Glam Slam, it feels cursed. There's a firebomb in the club. Morse magically sets fire to a plant after peeing on it. The stage is wrecked in a home invasion. A guitar is thrown through a front window. A Jeep crashes into the other front window. The venue is a target of rampant vandalism. All of this means the insurance is prohibitively high for someone in the kid's financial situation. The kid should hire some security, but honestly, he can't afford it. Number 11, the kid is still playing music no one likes but himself. At the same time that George is playing to a packed house across the street, the kid is performing a gospel orgy, Elephants and Flowers, to an empty club. People are literally fleeing from the club to get away from this song. Half his band is across the street at George's. And speaking of bands, the kid's band is enormous, meaning expensive. The PNCU version of the MPG has like nine people, more when they're performing in street battles. That's a lot of musicians to pay. What a fall from grace this is for the kid. You go from a club that pays your band so well, they don't bother looking for other work, to a band that has to dance in the street for coins with Tevin Campbell. 13, Pandemonium is the only club that operates like a real business. It's a proper upscale supper club with clear branding, serves drinks and food in a clean, well-lit, classy establishment. It has servers, ambient dancers, and live music. It has coat check. It has a dress code, or at least an unspoken expectation. I mean, it still let these guys in. But, 15 problem, Morris Day isn't a club owner. He's a crime boss. The time in Graffiti Bridge isn't a band so much as a criminal enterprise that knows how to play instruments. Morse extorts the businesses around him. He disturbs the peace on other people's stages. He pays off the mayor to keep police out of the Seven Corners area. He slips Mickey's into women's drinks, all illegal activities. When asked about a raise for the band by bass player slash extortionist Terry Lewis, Morse's idea of labor negotiations is challenging Terry to a hot chili pepper eating contest. I'm not sure how that settles things for the other five grown men with bills to pay, but whatever. This is the kind of business you practice when business isn't the order of the day. The time is the mafia, inflicting violence and threat of harm whenever the spread is challenged. If Morris were a proper businessman, he would have just bought Glam Slam like a proper gentrifier. In closing, Graffiti Bridge is a complete and utter rock fantasy. But let's be clear, the nightclubs in Graffiti Bridge break nine out of 10 Biggie Smalls crack commandments, which brings us to our last nightclub, Under the Cherry Moon, boom. Under the Cherry Moon came out in 1986, two years after Purple Rain, to horrible reviews and abysmal box office. It tanked on every front except album sales. This was a crime. 
There is a lot to commend about this film. It subverts most of the ways in which we have come to know Prince through Purple Rain. Purple, naked, egomaniacal, abusive, never really in control, childlike. And it replaces it with a suave, calculating player. The failure is also, and perhaps most unfortunate, because out of Prince's films before or after, this is the one that presents Prince most like a normal person. He is funny, coy, vulnerable, drunk, and black as hell. Anyhow, let's get down to business, or rather the business of nightclubs. The story takes place along the French Riviera between Antibes and Nice. It's historically a resort area for royalty. The whole coastline is balling out of control. High tourism, many festivals year-round. The club in question is the historic and uber-swank Hotel du Cap Edenrock. This place is so baller. It didn't even accept credit cards until 2006. So, was the club and Under the Cherry Moon a realistic portrayal of the kind of venues we've been interrogating? The answer is a resounding yes. Hotel du Cap is 100% as high-end in real life as portrayed in Cherry Moon. I don't think they even did any set design except add some sheer curtains. There is no high-end cap here. The lowest budget thing in the joint is Prince and Tricky. So that's all I have time to break down, and I still went a little over time. In the full version of this presentation, I'd answer some other key questions like, did Prince save any money by living under the stage in Glam Slam? How much money was Mary Sharon worth in Cherry Moon? How many times has Prince allowed himself to be seen eating on a film? But the time prevents me from pressing on. Thank you for hanging out. Thank you, D'Angela, for the invitation. And everyone else, please enjoy the rest of the symposium.